There will be no escapes from this camp. It was the incredible story of captured airmen that no prison could hold. A lot of the chaps were really escape crazy. They lived and dreamed escaping. How many are you taking out? 250. 250? It was a film that celebrated the unbelievable exploits of real-life heroes. We were proud of what we did. We were just darn sorry that the 50 were murdered as a result of it. But when The Great Escape rode the crest of critical acclaim in 1963, few knew how the facts had been changed to ensure box office success. And just how many detours from the truth had been taken to meet the demands of Hollywood and its stars. In 1963, the film The Great Escape brought to life a daring and ingenious plan to liberate more than 200 men from Stalag Luft III, the most secure prisoner of war camp in the heart of Hitler's Germany. This time we'll dig straight down 30 feet before we go horizontal. That'll rule out any question of sound detection or probing. All right, Roger, but did you say the first tunnel? I did. There'll be three. If the goons find one, we'll move into the other. How many men do you plan to take out, Roger? 250. It's impossible to make a place escape proof, believe me. Especially if you've got anybody with any brains. And if you've got 2,000 guys with brains all thinking the same thing, there's no way they can keep you in. One of the real life prisoners was Australian pilot Paul Brickhill who had been shot down by the Germans in Tunisia in 1943 and brought to Germany where he was held in Stalag Luft III until 1945. While in captivity, Brick Hill was involved in the construction of three tunnels, including the 350-foot underground passage through which 76 men escaped in March 1944. Paul Brickhill was sort of the, the official historian of the uh, escape organization. He was allowed access to all of the workshops, everything that was going on, because I think the escape leaders realized that this was a, a big operation and that they wanted the story to be told at some point. In 1950, Brickhill published a memoir of his wartime experiences, which immediately caught the attention of Hollywood director John Sturgis, who had produced documentaries for the Army Air Corps during World War II. After the war, Sturgis earned a reputation for directing ensemble cast in predominantly male stories, such as Bad Day at Black Rock. Sturgis wanted to turn Brickhill's book, The Great Escape, into a film. John thought it would make a great motion picture, but he, he was convinced that it was about, um, really about nobility and, and honor. Brickhill turned down many film offers for his book because he didn't want to exploit the story. But Sturgis continued to pursue Brickhill. John was a true bulldog. He never gave up on anything. And he continued to hound and persuade. And, and I think he said all the right things because he was a scholar of that subject matter. Once he finally gained Brickhill's approval, Sturgis still faced the difficult task of persuading a film studio to take on the project. During the 1950s, John Sturgis was under contract to MGM and had pitched the idea to Louis B. Mayer. Mayer rejected the story as too complicated and too expensive. But in 1960, the director scored a huge success with The Magnificent Seven. He now had the leverage he needed to convince the Mirish Company and United Artists to produce the film. The real escape operation had involved hundreds of men. Sturgis wanted to distill their stories into fewer characters, but still remain true to the story. I think there's always a concern to make a picture as accurate as you can and then have some creative license to adjust to make it entertainment and I think we held to this very closely 
maybe in some cases, characters were altered a little bit. In 1962, Steve McQueen, James Garner, James Coburn, and Charles Bronson were among the first actors signed to the movie, all portraying characters based on a combination of real people. Most of those characters, for example, James Gardner as the scrounger, those roles were performed by a very large number of people. But while most characters were composites of real people, one role did stand out, that of Roger Bartlett. Bartlett was based on Roger Bushel, a 33-year-old South African pilot who had played a unique role in devising the master escape plan. Roger Bushnell was a very impressive person. He was a hard man and a very just man, and a great admiration for him. Determined to fill this key role authentically, the director chose British actor Richard Attenborough. We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the goons to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. As the rest of the cast came together, the script was completed by W.R. Burnett, an American screenwriter best known for writing gritty novels like The Asphalt Jungle. Sturgis then brought on Australian-born writer James Clavell in the hope that he would ensure that the British characters were realistically created. The next step was to find a suitable location where the filmmakers could reconstruct the infamous prison camp. The image of that dialogue was, besides the wire and, and the fences, there was this enormous forest. How would you get through that if you did get out? So I found six very crummy, scrawny pine trees, six, between Idlewild and Palm Springs. And I said, John, I, I found the Black Forest. Just come and look at this. And he was fighting laughter and everything else as we looked at these terrible six trees. He said, no, this will be fine. So the plan was we would build the camp around these six trees and call it the Black Forest. A problem developed when the Screen Extras Guild prohibited the production from using local people as extras. Faced with the expense of bringing hundreds of extras more than 100 miles from Los Angeles every day, assistant director Bob Relia was dispatched to Europe to look for alternative locations. I called John and said, I got some bad news for you. Guess what Germany looks like? It looks like Germany. It's criminal if we don't make the whole thing right here. It's just, it's crazy. It, it looks like Germany. And then we both swallowed hard and decided to go there. The production was to be based at the Bavaria Studios outside Munich. Since the studios were surrounded by pine trees, the camp could be recreated right beside the sound stages. Conscious of Brick Hill's concerns about accuracy, Sergius wanted his help on the design and layout of the camp. He phoned Australia and asked him, uh, Paul Brickhill to come, and Paul said, no, I've been sick, I can't possibly. He said, have you any suggestions? He said, yes, I can tell you exactly who to take. Go to Canada and get Wally Floody. He built the thing. He'll know more about it than anybody else. During captivity in Stalag Luft Three, Canadian airman Wally Floody had been responsible for the overall design and plan of the three escape tunnels. After the war, he had returned to his native country. Floody had become an insurance executive in Canada. We made a deal with him to come over and spend uh, two months with us, a month of preparation and the first month of shooting. Wally sent for his logbook, and up behind Sturgis on his desk, he had all the little authentic pictures of what Stalag Love 3 that had come out of Wally's thing. Oh, yes, he wanted it to be authentic very much. With Wally Floody on board as technical advisor, the filmmakers set about building the notorious prison camp. The real Stalag Luft III had caged 10,000 Allied airmen in six compounds. For the film, the producers built one compound, 
and hired American students from the nearby university as extras. The towers and the wires and structure and the huts and all that, were, it was exactly as it was. And the guards and the setup, that really struck me as being remarkable. They did a wonderful job of that. In June 1962, the international cast and crew assembled in Bavaria, and cameras rolled on the recreation of one of the most famous escapes in military history. Hey, did you see the cooler? Boy, is it ever a big one. I think they expect a lot of business. Yeah. How far are the trees, Danny? Over 200 feet. Yeah, I'd say 300. Long ways to dig. We'll get Cavendish to make a survey. I wish Big X were here. 